morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome everyone to session 6B, which is asphalt production, paving, and compaction techniques. Uh, my name is Malcolm Sims, I'm director of MPA Asphalt, that's the UK Trade Association for Asphalt Producers and Contractors, and the UK member of IAPA, and I'll be your chair for this session. Uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps, the weather here in the UK is not as good as I expect it would be in Madrid, but uh, definitely somewhat better than recent months. Anyway, hopefully all the IT will work smoothly and we can give you an informative and maybe even entertaining session. Hopefully the papers you will see presented here in this session and those in the proceedings will give you some new thinking and updates to your knowledge. Um, as with all the other technical sessions, there'll be six presentations and we'll take these in two blocks of three with the opportunity for you to submit questions to be answered live in between each half session by Slido. Uh, Slido is in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and I'm sure you've seen how this works already. So you type in your question and submit it and if you see a question you like you can vote it up with a thumbs up button for those that you want to hear answered. So uh, without further delay let's get going with your first presentation by Jorge Ortiz Ripo. Jorge is an MSc in civil engineering with a professional career of more than 35 years. He has a wide experience managing industrial facilities of aggregates, asphalt, concrete, precast concrete, bituminous emulsions and modified bitumen, and planning, planning and executing works with all sorts of asphalt mixtures. At present, he is the research manager in Arno. He was president of ASEFMA, the Asphalt Industry Association of Spain from 2006 to 2009, and is an active AAPT member since 2001. He's author of more than 20 technical articles published in national and international journals and nearly 50 papers in national and international conferences. His paper 0154 is titled Innovative Tack Coats for Improving Durability of Bituminous Layers. And uh, could we now transfer the screen to Jorge's presentation, please? Good morning, and let me begin thanking the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this event. I'm going to speak about the possibilities opened by milk of lime treatments to improve the shear strength of bituminous interfaces and the fatigue life of bituminous layers. This is a paper based in the work developed as a part of the research project called Superbit. Authors we like to thank the Dedic Center for its support. Essentially, the protection of tack coats with lime is based in the application of a small rate of calcium hydroxide and around 15 grams per square meter. Place it in the form of a highly diluted lime milk over the binder film. This is slurry may be extended immediately after, after bituminous emulsion breaks, and preferably when its water has completely evaporated. It's not necessary to wait after this moment to have a completely effective protection of the binder film that must provide addition between asphalt layers. The milk of lime application has at least Free effects related to the integrity of the tack coat preservation. Calcium hydroxide particles prevent direct contact of the residual binder film to the tires of the work vehicles. Uh, surface wetting reduces the temperature of the binder fan, limiting the tire pickup capacity, and the temperature of the top surface of the existing pavement is also reduced as a result of the water emulsion evaporation. This helps again to safeguard the integrity of the binder film. This treatment does not damage the bituminous interfaces, uh, nor stre strength, as has been repeatedly verified by direct share and direct tensile test. On the contrary, some precedents show the milk of lime can be re referred to improve the bituminous interfaces shear strength. The reported improvement found when dusty condition has been simulated in other research programs 
the potential of calcium hydroxide as a bituminous binder in the stiffener, and the results reported in a Polish research were increasing calcium hydroxide concentration result in shared strength gains. To characterize real interspaces, we have used the Uthans model to propose using an, a linear relation between the shared stress and the relative displacement and the interface. He called horizontal reaction modulus, okay, to the corresponding proportionality coefficient. Usans model allows to do sensitivity analysis of the effects of different interface conditions represented by different K values with calculation tools as bizarre. The interface uh, can be characterized. The empirical approach to the value of K, however, is somewhat more complex that what can be deduced from the usance model. In real test, the slope of the tension displacement curve varies with the stress, uh, forcing to select the load level at which the tangent is measured. On the other hand, the viscoelastic nature of the interfaces provides it with a, with a behavior that depends on the temperature and the load time. Therefore, to obtain realistic estimation results, it's necessary to, property, to properly simulate the load times and, temperature, and temperatures typical of the actual stresses. In accordance with our calculation, the displacement speed of 50 millimeters per minute has been selected as representative of the loading times corresponding to actual solicitations of interfaces with horizontal reaction modulus between 5 and 25 megapascals per millimeter or expected values in the one union under study. And in order to carry out laboratory studies, an experimental section was constructed designed to test up to 36 different treatments by means of the extraction of successive series of cores. The addition treatments carried out with different emulsions, additive, and milk of flying rates were applied manually by means of a spray gun. Completed the treatment, a five centimeter thick layer of hot bituminous mixture type AC16 was extended. After this, 111 cores were extracted and analyzed. The results obtained show how the application of lime increased the shared strength of the interface between the existing layer and the new layer of bituminous mixture, whatever the rate of the tack coat, reaching a maximum value around 40 grams per square meter. The same trend can be observed in relation to the K modulus. K increased always regarding no line interfaces and its maximum value is reached around 40 grams per square meter of calcium hydroxide. The distribution of lime also influences the optimal receivable binder rate. With no lime interfaces, the shared strength of the interface increases with the rate of bituminous binder throughout the entire range of the application rate. Uh, although in the Treated interfaces, the shear strength seems to grow to a maximum for approximately 400 grams per square meter. The effects are more favorable with 30 grams of calcium hydroxide because with 60 grams, the optimal binder explication rate seems to decrease sooner, and the corresponding values are lower than the ones obtained with 15 grams of line. The same applies for the horizontal reaction modulus. Now, the maximum value is around 40 grams per square Sorry, 400 grams per square meter are clearly observed, except for 15 grams of lime. Again, the effects are more favorable with 30 grams per square meter of calcium hydroxide 
when the optimum application ratings reach a tuner approximately at 400 grams per square meter. The set of results uh, suggest that under the condition of the and with the material tested, the best interfaces are obtained using 30, uh, 350 to 400 grams per square meter of residual bitumen and 35 to 40 grams per square meter of line. For my conclusion, are that the application of highly diluted lime slurry of, uh, in addition to warranty the cleanliness of the works allows to propose significant improvement in the bond, in the bond between bituminous layers. These improvements can be measured both in terms of maximum shear strength as well in relation to the shear stiffness modulus. This last parameter is of great importance from the point of view of the payment durability because it affects the payment stress distribution and particularly, particularly in the top layer. And through proper calculations with tools that allow to consider the effect of K as this are shower, the extent of this effect can be quantified. However, when stiffness of interfaces increases, it is a good idea to check their share fatigue life. With this objective, the Department of Civil of an Environmental Engineering of the Polytechnic University of Catalonia has developed a new dynamic test based on the V device of the NLT 382 standard, useful to obtain shear fatigue allows of the bituminous interfaces and to estimate the possible effect of the new more rigid interfaces on the payment layer durability. This is a subsequent work of the Superbit project, and the result of this development will be presented in the next ninth IATA Congress that will be take place on June in Vienna. Thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, I will be pleased to answer them today in the question time or any other time if you contact me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jorge, for this very interesting concept. Um, and I know from recent UK experience and discussions, it will be of uh, potential interest over here in ensuring the importance of bond between layers for pavement durability. So thanks again. Um, so next up, we have a presentation from uh, Iswan Daru Wijat Moko, um, or Daru, as we know him in the UK. Uh, Daru leads the Pavement Materials Research Team of ACOM. He's a UK Chartered Engineer and Fellow of the Institute of Asphalt Technology and the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation. He has more than 25 years of experience in implementation of the latest developments in road paving materials into industry practices in the UK and overseas. His work includes design, specification, construction, assessment, investigation, end of life solutions and managing our own collaborative research program. This paper, 0160, evaluation of innovative automated systems for monitoring asphalt pavement surface conditions in England was one of a number of papers and this one addresses surface regularity and texture. Now, I have to declare a personal interest in this paper as a co-author, but I'm sure it'll still be highly informative for everyone. And uh, don't forget to keep your questions coming in on Slido, and please now direct your attention to the presentation by Daru. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share our research on evaluation of innovative automated systems for monitoring asphalt surface conditions in England. My name is Darwit Yatmoko from ACOM, and today I will present part one of this research on surface regularity and texture. This work was part of the collaborative research between Highways England, Mineral Product Association, European UK, and ACOM. Before proceedings, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Giacomo D'Angelo, Isu, Robin hudson Griffiths, Arash Khajinian, Malcolm Sims, and David Kyles. Also, I would like to thank the funding bodies and to all parties 
who have supported this research. This project explored the possibility of incorporating recent technology and automation in quality monitoring equipment as an alternative to the conventional testing of asphalt pavements. The driver was uh, the conventional test methods inherently carry safety risk for the site operators who undertake the works. The use of automated technologies currently available to the construction industry could remove or mitigate the exposure of site operators. Hence, ultimately, the objectives from this research were to improve safety, quality, and efficiency. At the start of this research, we completed review on various methods to measure surface regularity of road pavement. As we know, surface regularity contributes to user experience, comfort, and safety. We explored conventional methods and the more advanced machine-based methods as summarized in this table. We considered availability of the equipment, precision and accuracy, speed of measurements, sampling regimes, technology readiness level, scope for automation, and contribution to a BIM, building information modeling, and the potential use for compliant testing. And based on this consideration, one system was selected. Details can be found on the paper and the report listed at the end of these slides. We also explored a various methods to measure macro texture of road surfacing. As we know, macro texture is one of the important parameters for road safety. And we adopted a similar approaches and considerations as before. And based on these considerations, one system was also selected and details can be found on the paper. The adopted methods comprising laser-based sensors mounted on a survey vehicles to measure surface regularity, laser straight edge uh, was fitted, and to measure macro texture, 3D texture depth uh, sensors and an was analyzed. And HD uh, video was also fitted uh, to capture surface condition during the survey. And this system were developed and operated by uh, HDS, Highway Data System in England. And these pictures uh, illustrate uh, the difference between manual and machine-based handling. Here we can see what are the main benefits from uh, using the uh, laser-based laser -based surface. Uh, one is uh, the risk. The risk can be massively reduced. As we can see from the figures on the top, uh, the operator has got to push along a rolling straight edge uh, whilst uh, there, there are some construction traffic. Hence, removing the side operators and replacing by sensors will improve safety on site. And also digital data collected by the sensors continuously uh, monitor the, the condition of the surface with the uh, timestamp and GPS location attached to them. And this data can be integrated into a BIM, a Building Information Modeling, or PMS, Pavement Management System. And for the data analysis, we refer to UK specification for how it works, whereby we state uh, that they state uh, the maximum permitted number of surface irregularities for a given uh, length of section, either 75 meter or 300 meter section. And we assess the total number of irregularities recorded for each section, which are above four millimeter, seven millimeter and 10 millimeter. This table summarizes uh, the result from 12 number of road resurfacing projects in England, where, where we did the trials. As you can see from this table, the result, uh, they are quite comparable between the two, uh, providing pass-fill uh, criteria against the project specification. One particular road, A269, uh, which uh, seems to be at odd on, on the test result, these are uh, uh, roads uh, which runs uh, across small towns and villages, which include junctions and iron works. The uh, conventional rolling straight edge survey would typically avoid these uh, iron works and other road features, whilst the laser based survey is more likely to drive over these features in a straight run. And therefore, the importance for having the uh, high definition uh, video to capture the surface condition to allow uh, post uh, data collection processing. And we also did repeatability testing using the same equipment on uh, around one kilometer uh, uh, trial section. And we did uh, 10 runs for the repeatability assessment and recorded uh, those irregularity above four, seven or 10 millimeter. Initially, the data appeared to be quite uh, 
concerning with the high uh, error margin. However, having closer, closer looks on the uh, video survey, we found uh, there is a join on the first 10 meter. Removing that data from the first 10 meter improved the uh, error margin su substantially, and we, we can find a good repeatability between the 10 test runs. So the, uh, the summary, uh, the laser based methods appear to approximate the uh, manual handling, the conventional rolling straight edge. Uh, furthermore, uh, the laser based methods detect more irregularity. Uh, also, the trial on repeatability show good consist consistency on the test result. However, we realize we need to do more works on repro reproducibility of this assessment. And on the second uh, assessment uh, was on the macro texture, on the texture depth assessment. As you can see from these pictures on the top, uh, operators carrying out volumetric parts testing. And uh, the benefits are more or less similar to the, uh, the previous exercise, whereby the risk can be reduced by removing technician from set and replacing the technician with sensors and also the digital data which uh, were collected by uh, the lesser uh, base uh, sensors can be incorporated into PIM and PMS. <coughs> However, we realize uh, that the, the, these two systems works in slightly different ways. The volumetric parts are normally uh, done on a 50 meter section in a diagonal direction to the lane width. Whilst the uh, laser 3D uh, TD uh, assessment uh, was done along the direction of the travel. However, this is not a, a problem for new surfacing because the new surfacing should have a more or less uh, or expected to have uh, uniform textures across the direction. And these are the findings from our trials from the 13 number of road sites in England with uh, two different uh, types of surfacing, one with uh, 10 millimeter nominal aggregate size and the other with 14 millimeter aggregate size. As you can see, the result appear to be comparable and the uh, mirroring uh, between uh, the two test methods, between the manual uh, method and the lesser based method. And this a uh, table show the variation between methods. As you can see, between the two test methods, the variation on average, there are about 8%, whilst the variation within uh, the traditional method or the conventional volumetric patch method is uh, uh, on average around 7%. So they are pretty similar in terms of the variation between uh, the, the two test methods. And uh, on the repeatability exercise, we also found the uh, from the test run that we did, uh, the error margin was only 4%, which indicates a good repeatable uh, result uh, between uh, different uh, repetition of testing using the laser-based assessment. So in summary, the two test methods uh, between volumetric parts and the laser-based uh, macro texture assessment appear to be comparable in terms of results. And the variation between the two, they, they are uh, very low and a lot lower than the one cited in uh, British standard uh, EN 13036 part one, which is for the volumetric parts testing. And we also realized a further work would be required to assess the reproducibility of the laser based system. Uh, I mentioned uh, that there are reports can be downloaded. They can be downloaded from the Highways England website or from ACOM website, uh, which shown on these slides. So further work. Uh, here are our recommendations for further works. I'm pleased to say that uh, these recommendations are currently being conducted and carried out for further investigation. So we are hoping to uh, find our uh, results uh, within the next year or so. I think that's all I can share with everyone today. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And thank you, Daru, uh, for highlighting what we're doing in the UK in relation to digitalizing quality control and quality assurance of installation processes as one part of uh, Asphalt 4.0. Um, so the final paper for our presentation in this part of the session comes from uh, Raj Dongare. Uh, Dr. Dongare is currently a consultant to the Federal Highway Administration in the United States. Um, for the past 25 years, he's been involved with the refinement of various super paved specifications and development of standards. He has published numerous papers on material testing and specification. His expertise includes pavement design, formulation and production of polymer and chrome rubber modified asphalts, and, and pavement performance and forensic issues. 
Uh, he received his uh, MSc, uh, Master's and PhD degrees from uh, Penn State in the USA and his bachelor's degree in India. His background involves various aspects of asphalt highway engineering from the academic to research and consulting. He's owned a consulting engineering firm and testing laboratory for over 20 years, providing expertise with superior traditional testing and technical assistance, uh, particularly in polymer and rubber modification. He's a member of the Transportation Research Board, TRB, Association of Asphalt Pavement Technologists, the Canadian Technical Asphalt Association, and he's a past chairman of an ASTM subcommittee. His paper 0267, A Simple Test for Quality Control of Wrap Piles, certainly has the shortest title of this session, but I'm sure it will have an interesting approach on helping deliver enhanced quality of recycling and reuse activities. So with that, can we please start Dr. Dongre's presentation? Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Raj Dongre from United States of America. Uh, me and my colleagues, Sinjin Lee and Jack Yuchev, welcome you to our presentation, A Simple Test for Quality Control of Wrap Piles. Uh, uh, this slide is just a disclaimer, which says that the federal government or the state government does not endorse products or manufacturers. The objectives of this study was to develop an easy to use test so that wrap in its loose uncompacted test can be characterized to determine the consistency of our wrap pile and also to characterize the wrap. Now in the paper, you will find uh, other applications such as blend charts without extraction uh, and also mixed design uh, ideas uh, just using the Dwight test. We also develop protocols to assess the consistency of the wrap pile. Um, the scope of this study was limited to uh, several wraps we obtained from selected regions in the United States, and these regions uh, represented uh, various climatic regions, and as a result of that, various stiffness wraps. As you will see, uh, we also obtained 10 wrap samples from a local wrap pile for the consistency evaluation part of the experiment. So the Dwight is really called the Dongre Workability Test, um, and it was originally developed in 2015 to determine the workability of hot mix asphalt. There's a paper in AAPT in 2015, which showed that the results from this test can be used to determine the breakdown in rolling temperatures during compaction of hot mix asphalt. The test runs at 0.05 millimeters per second deformation rate and is conducted until it reaches 700 kilopascals. It's, it's conducted at 240 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for, uh, which I will talk about later. Now, no special equipment is um, required, only uh, updated software if, if you own the superpave gyratory compactor. Uh, in the United States, exclusively the superpave gyratory compactor is used, and we developed this test as a part of this uh, compactor so that after the test is conducted, you can use the same sample and proceed with with compacting a mixed design sample of 115 millimeter height. So in order to save time and material. Now the outputs from this test are uh, Dwight index, which is essentially a slope determined at 600 kilopascal stress level on the stress strain curve. And we also determine the energy under the stress strain curve. Uh, the next slide, this slide shows what the output of the Dwight uh, test is. It is essentially a stress strain curve. Uh, Two uh, stress strain curves are shown on this plot. One is conducted at 0 0.01 sec millimeters per second deformation rate. And the second one is at 0 0.05 millimeters per second. And this is to show how sensitive the test is and also the repeatability. Two reps are shown here. Uh, the slope is determined as shown by the red arrow uh, between 550 and 650 uh, with, with an average of 600 kilopascal. Um, the testing protocol was established now in this study to test the wrap, which is uh, used in uncompacted loose test. We first break it down. We take 4,200 grams of wrap. We break it down. We do two replicates and the sampling procedures from AASHTO are followed in uh, preparing the samples of the uncompacted wrap. Um, if you also want to determine the PG grade of the wrap grinder using uh, the artificial intelligence model also developed as part of the study, then you perform 
the test at an additional temperature. So the two test temperatures are uh, respectively 240 degrees Fahrenheit for the consistency testing, which is 116 degrees C, and 150 degrees Fahrenheit additional test temperature, which is 66 degrees C, if you want to predict the PG of the wrap binder. Um, the top plate and the mold are heated uh, during the test temperature, uh, as when the test, test is conducted, the test is stopped at 700 kilopascal. The Dwight value is determined as shown in the equation and the energy is computed as the area under the Dwight stress strain curve. This plot shows the sensitivity of the Dwight test to wrap obtained from various states in the United States. As you can see, uh, the higher Dwight value means more workable and the wrap obtained from Nebraska was deemed to be more workable. And this makes sense because Nebraska typically uses softer binders and the wrap doesn't age as, the mix doesn't age as much because of the climate. Whereas this wrap from PEVCON in Pennsylvania al also had lower binder content and it also uh, ages a lot. So you can see the difference that the Dwight picked up. You can also see why we picked the 240 degrees Fahrenheit test temperature for our consistency experiments because it seems to disc discriminate pretty well in that, at that temperature. Another advantage of using 240 degrees Fahrenheit or 116 degrees C is most of the compaction in the United States is done at 280 uh, Fahrenheit um, or 140 C. So it's very easy to obtain the 240 degrees uh, by cooling it down. In, now I'll talk about the consistency experiment. We obtained 10 wrap samples from a local Virginia wrap pile from a contractor. We went to different locations in that huge wrap pile uh, and we obtained samples. Uh, we, these samples were extracted, the binder was extracted and the aggregate after extraction was graded. And this is the result of the gradation. As you can see, most of the samples were consistent in a band, one sample was slightly off. We also determined the asphalt content of the 10 samples and it varied from five as a maximum to 4.2 as a minimum and with an average value of 4.6. So the variation in the wrap AC content that we obtained was 7% coefficient of variation. The high temperature PG variation was 3% coefficient of variation. The low PG was 10%, was higher. Now going to the Dwight values at 240 degrees Fahrenheit and 116, uh, 116C, we obtained an average Dwight value of 147 with a coefficient of vari variation of 3%. And on the energy, we obtained an average energy value of 2394 with a coefficient of variation of 3%. So it's a very uh, consistent uh, across the 10 samples. We, um, at the time of completion uh, of this uh, 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 presentation, I was also able to test additional samples from Maryland, also hot mix asphalt wrap. And again, once again, you can see the coefficient of variations follow the same trend with the Maryland pile being more consistent of plus or minus 2% on the Dwight value and the energy value. We were also able to obtain a stone matrix asphalt or an open graded wrap from South Carolina. Here you find that the coefficient of variations are slightly higher all across the board. Uh, the Dwight value is 6% and the energy value is 8%. You can also note very quickly that the energy average energy values are 164 and 39 for uh, 3095 for SMA. For the Maryland HMA, it was 156 and 2400. And for the Virginia wrap, it was 147 and 2394. So it can discriminate very easily. Our findings and conclusions are that we found that the Dwight test can easily characterize wrap in an uncompacted loose stat test. The our state, the Dwight's repeatability values were between three to five percent. It also we also found that it holds a potential to be used because of its low coefficient of variation and uh, uh, less time consumption. It's a very quick test it can be used in lieu or in instead of extraction and recovery to determine the consistency of wrap obtained from a wrap pile. You can also obtain the PG grade of the wrap without extraction if you use the additional test temperature and the AI model. Our future efforts will expand on, uh, will expand on uh, these findings. 
Uh, the implementation proposal is that if one wants to use this test to assess the consistency of a rap pile, uh, they should obtain 10 rap samples from various locations of the rap pile. You conduct the Dwight test at the given 240 degrees or 116 degrees C temperature. You determine the Dwight and the Dwight energy value. You check to see if, you, if, if your wrap pile is within the plus or minus 5% coefficient of variation for both the Dwight value and the energy value. And if you need the PG, you can get the PG by running an additional temperature. Thank you, and I'll answer any questions. Lovely. Thank you, Raj, for that uh, interesting presentation. Anything that uh, introduces simplicity you know, always seems like a good idea to me. Uh, so now we have uh, just under 10 minutes or so set aside for questions that have been coming in on Slido. Um, so I'll ask just quickly if the presenters, uh, Raj, Tari, or, yeah, they're all there on camera. And if you open your mics and just say a quick hello, uh, we'll Hi. wait for some more final questions. Can you hear me? Yeah, got your okay. eyes. Great. All right. Um, let's get the right windows open. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, I'm letting you down here with the technology. Right, Slido. So, firstly, uh, for Jorge. Um, Hello, Martin. Couple of questions here relating to the, the practical issues around lime milk. Um, I'll bundle these together and see how we go. Um, is lime milk difficult to manufacture? Uh, what's the sort of production process for it? Uh, does it remain stable? And are any other additives used in it? And then going on from that, what's the time frame for application of the emulsion um, from breaking, sorry, application of the lime milk after the breaking of the emulsion and before paving? Is there a, is there a curing process perhaps that needs to happen before it can be paved? Okay. Uh, well, uh, we, we buy the uh, uh, lime in, a, in form of concentrated uh, solution of, uh, of lime uh, produces for another uh, production. The question important is the fineness of of the line. Uh, it is, it's about, in, 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 our, in our cases, in a line about uh, four microns uh, average, uh, uh, average uh, size. And it, it's important in, uh, to prevent the sedimentation of, of the line. Uh, this concentrated in, uh, solution, we, uh, uh, we dilute this this concentrated emulsion ten times to have the solution to do the the works. Uh, so it's not no, we we don't make the, the line. The line is a product product is a product of of, a, of an another enter, enterprise. Yeah. Uh, the times uh, when, well uh, the, the line the milk of line is can, can be can be sprayed uh, one time the emulsion has broken, broke it. Uh, it it's in, usually it, it about five, ten, 10 minutes. And after the, the spray, the, the line was sprayed, we recommend to wait for the evaporation of water. But it's not absolutely necessary, but it is. We, we prefer the uh, way to the evaporation, and it depends on the condi climatic conditions. Uh, 20 minutes, uh, 40 minutes, it, it depends. So. And then from application of the lime to paving, is that immediate or? Application of the lime in, is, is immediately after the, the, after the pack coat. After the emulsion breaks, yeah. But the time from applying the lime to applying the asphalt, the time for applying the uh, was uh, the the lime is a is a diluted uh, solution. Uh, yeah. It has uh, ten parts of water for part, part of lime. Uh, it, 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 uh, we must wait to the evaporation of water about. 20, also, 30, okay, 40 minutes 
to, to do the, the layer of Bartrow. That's my layer. Okay. Right. Great. I got that. Thanks very much. Um, again, with the limited time, I'll move swiftly on to Daru and the question that came in on Slido. Um, in terms of laser system to replace texture depth work, um, how is that? Um, I'm sorry, is that likely to work on typical UK conditions of a, a wet road in the middle of the night when we're trying to trying to do these measures? Uh, and meanwhile, somebody's driving up behind you wanting to put white lines on. Is, is the laser system going to be able to cope with those conditions? Thank you for the question. That's a very, very good question. Uh, I suppose um, that should be avoided. And that was uh, our recommendation uh, uh, for this assessment as well, which is similar to what we would have done with volumetric parts. With volumetric parts, uh, we will avoid any dampness or uh, uh, doing it un under the wet condition. One particular uh, thing uh, with, with the laser measurement is that it is quite, uh, uh, well, one is to require a dry surface and a, a good condition in the sense that uh, allowing the laser sensor to receive a, a feedback. Uh, and the timing is quite uh, important as well. Uh, during the more recent works, as a follow-up work from this one, we noticed that we need to allow times before, uh, pl uh, after placing the, the, uh, the surfacing and the laser measurement. If we do it immediately, and if we do it a few days after, the result might be slightly different. So the, the, there, there, there is time need to be allowed for the materials to settle in terms of surface appearance uh, before we can get a uh, more repeatable result but that can be overcome by uh, adding more sensors as well. But yeah, that is a good question. I don't know how much better or worse in comparison against volumetric parts when it comes to uh, doing the test under on the surfacing, uh, which is, which is uh, in a damp condition, but this is something that we should be avoided. Yeah, and clearly the same would apply for the uh, straight edge, if it's laser based in the same conditions. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Daru. And um, uh, one for Raj um, uh, from Alexandros Margaritas. Uh, how do you explain the fact that for some cases, the workability factor goes down when you increase the temperature? You would expect an increase. Um, it, uh, it, uh, the, the way the workability really works is uh, you would see that when the test is conducted at 77 degrees Fahrenheit or room temperature of 25, it actually goes down. Then as the temperature is increased, it goes up. So the way it works is when you're at lower temperatures, the asphalt coating stiffness is closer to the aggregate stiffness. And therefore, if you keep dropping that temperature, your workability value will resemble that of just graded asphalt, which is by the way, much higher than asphalt with binder in it, you know, because a graded material, as soon as you put it in, it's it, within one pass, you can compact it, right? So then when you increase the temperature, the shear resistance of the asphalt coating starts to come in play. Now, as you increase temperature further, going up to 300 Fahrenheit um, and higher, once again, the asphalt contribution, because it becomes uh, less viscous and almost oil-like, that the aggregate contribution then again starts kicking in. So it's like an inverted trough, and the area under that inverted trough is really the compactive effort of the energy that you're using. So this was a finding that before I did this, I did not really understand how, how asphalt and the aggregate work together in the asphalt concrete system. So I hope that answers your question. Great, thanks, that sounds perfectly reasonable and well-informed to my knowledge. Okay, so um, if we were in a, in a live room, I would ask the audience to show their appreciation with a round of applause for the, uh, the speakers, their efforts and their answering your questions. Um, but being automatic, we just have to move swiftly on. So I'll give my personal thanks to you three guys and uh, I will catch you later. Take care, everyone.
Right, so we'll move on to the uh, second part of our session. And um, our first presentation comes from uh, Richard Fox Ivy. Richard has more than 20 years experience in transportation infrastructure management field. He works with end users to successfully deploy 3D laser and image processing, processing technology for the automatic, automated sorry, inspection of roadways, runways, railways and tunnels. Since his start in the industry, he's been involved with the inspection and analysis of more than 500,000 miles of asset condition data. His paper 0280, high resolution multi-lane road surface mapping using 3D laser profilers for 3D paving and milling projects may add to some of the considerations in, in Dari's presentation just now. So uh, please give your attention to this presentation by Richard Fox Ivy. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to make a presentation today on 3D profiling technology for milling and shimming applications. First, a little uh, background on the company. Pavemetrics was founded in 2009. We are a spin-off of Canada's National Optics Institute. And really, we do two things. We develop 3D sensor technology and algorithms for processing the data from those sensors. And our technology is used around the world to inspect everything from roadways to runways, railways, uh, tunnels, sidewalks. And we have a lot of experience doing that. We've delivered more than 400 systems to 45 plus countries around the world. Uh, a bit of background on the technology I'll be talking about. Uh, the LDTM concept combines 3D laser profiles with inertially corrected GPS position of an inspection vehicle. It corrects those 3D laser profiles for heading motion, um, uh, vehicle motion as it rolls down the road. It corrects the GPS position using base station data and it aligns the points of those 3D scans back to traditional survey points. And the end result is a 3D surface of the entire road that has a two to three millimeter absolute positional accuracy, uh, which is suitable for million paving type applications, as well as many others, as you can see in this example here uh, from this synthesis, uh, grade work, uh, quality measurements, progress checks, uh, pavement thickness checks, many different applications of 3D profiling data. So uh, I did mention absolute accuracy, and I just wanted to touch on that uh, the notion of relative versus absolute. So in the left image, you can see an example where you have a 3D scan that's kind of floating in space. That has high relative accuracy. If you were to measure the uh, position between two points, maybe two parts of a crack, you'd be accurate within millimeters. But absolute accuracy isn't very good there. It's off by feet, uh, many feet, many meters. Uh, whereas on the right, you have both high relative accuracy in that 3D scan, and it's positioned well on the road. So its measurement in relation to other real world features is quite high. And that's what we mean by absolute accuracy. So technology wise, what goes into this solution? Um, first thing is 3D laser scan data from very high uh, resolution scanners. It's about 112 million points per second. Each of those sensors has an inertial measurement unit inside it, which is measuring the motion of the sensor, the pitch, roll, and heading. Uh, there's a wheel encoder, which is mounted on a driving wheel, which is giving linear distance. A calibration object, which isn't shown here, but we'll, we'll touch on in a second. Um, and a piece of software, the, the processing software that allows for all that data to be integrated. You need to have a high accuracy GNSS, uh, which is a black box there, which combines GPS technology and uh, inertial technology. Um, and you need a base station. So either a continuously operating uh, base station network uh, like you have in the United States or a, a base station set up within 20 meters of the work site. So thinking about accuracy and how all these pieces play a role, um, let's kind of step through that. So uh, typical application of 3D scanning technology for pavement inspection, your accuracy would only be 60 to 100 centimeters. And you'd only be reporting the GPS coordinates every five or 10 meter file. So really not suitable for our application. So the first step is to bring in that LDTM software, which will translate the GPS position of the vehicle down to individual points on the road um, and to bring in a high accuracy GNSS. You're still only gonna be around 50 centimeters, uh, but your, your points are now mapped to individual points on the road. Um, however, if you bring in base station data, you can then bring that accuracy down to about two centimeters. And if we tie it to traditional survey, 
now we're in the millimeter range. We're at about five millimeters if we use one control point per kilometer. And if we add another two control points, so three control points per kilometer, now we get into that two to three millimeter range, which is effectively the same accuracy as your GPS total station. Uh, so I, I did mention that it's using a very high resolution scanner just to kind of give some frame of reference because everyone is familiar with LIDAR, I think, nowadays. Um, this system uh, captures about 112 million points a second. Mobile LIDAR would normally be maybe three to four million points a second. So it's significantly higher resolution than mobile LIDAR, and that's part of the secret of getting these results. Um, typical vehicle installation, you have the sensors mounted at the rear of the vehicle attached to a structure on the roof. Uh, you have a GPS antenna on the vehicle. You have that wheel encoder or the DMI. Um, in the rear of the vehicle, you have a data acquisition computer, a data storage computer, and a power inverter, and you have an operator station uh, up front. Before you do your data collection, you have to calibrate the system. Uh, there are static calibration uh, components and mobile calibration or dy dynamic calibration components. Static is uh, measuring the distances between different components like GPS and DMI to the sensors to translate those coordinates down to parts of the scan. And then the mobile uh, components are to compensate for vehicle motion when you're scanning. So thinking about data collection, uh, before you go and you do your uh, LDTM laser scanning, you do need to mark your control points so that they're within the field of view of the scans. When you do your scanning, you only need one uh, scan per driven lane. Um, so one scan per lane. And if you're doing something wide, like a multi-lane highway or maybe an airport runway, you might do a few passes just to complete that, that complete surface. So four meter wide scan, and you might need multiple scans. And you want a little bit of overlap, maybe about 15 centimeters between those scans to make sure there's nothing you miss. Uh, so uh, when it comes to data processing, you take all of those 3D scans back into the office. Um, and uh, if you have your control points marked in advance of your scans, you'll see those targets in the data. In the example here, you can see there's a circular target um, circling a, an intersection of a longitudinal transverse joint. At the center of that is an orange point, and that represents the center of that target according to traditional survey. The green point is the position determined using the real-time GPS solution. Um, so in order to correct uh, the real-time solution to the traditional survey, you simply drag the uh, green coordinate down to the orange coordinate, and that will then correct the entire surface outward from that point. Uh, so uh, if you are scanning a wide surface, as I mentioned before, you'd make multiple passes. And uh, this is an automated process. It looks for a feature that is available in each uh, one of the scans. Could be something that's 2D or 3D, and it matches those up and stitches them together. So in this example here, you can see on the top left, you have two pavement markings that are actually the same marking. And uh, after stitching, they overlap on top of one another uh, properly. Uh, bring the base station data, just a simple text file from your, your cores or from your uh, base station that you set up on site. And then uh, at this point, you're ready to output a 3D surface. So uh, output format is LAS, which is a uh, non-proprietary standard 3D format uh, in, in the uh, LiDAR industry, actually. So uh, is this an accurate solution, or how do we uh, know that it's an accurate solution? So uh, we did a fairly um, detailed uh, evaluation of the system using 500 test targets that were surveyed three times each using a GPS total station. And the average of those three surveys was used as the official uh, XYZ for that uh, target. Um, then we drove that test site 12 times uh, so that we would have uh, the ability to evaluate the repeatability of the system. Uh, we then imported the traditional survey coordinates as well as the LDTM coordinates into the software. And basically we're looking at the position of the center of those targets for the traditional survey compared to LDTM, assuming that traditional survey is, is accurate. We looked at two different scenarios, uh, one where we used one control point every 300 meters, so that's about three per kilometer, and the absolute positional accuracy of those targets was about 2.5 millimeters, um, and the repeatability was two millimeters for the LDTM solution. So Basically, if you use three control points per kilometer, you can get the same kind of accuracy with LDTM as you can with traditional survey, but of course, across millions and millions of points. 
Then the other scenario we looked at was just one control point per 800 meters or so, so one per kilometer. And you can see the elevation accuracy there is five millimeters and the repeatability is four millimeters. So still very good, pretty close to traditional survey um, and a lot less time, a uh, lot less effort, a lot less cost and much, much more data. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks very much for your attention. Sorry, what? Yeah, uh, thanks, Richard. Um, fine example there of uh, digital, digitalization of our uh, processes for Asphalt Works is definitely fits the Asphalt 4.0 agenda. So uh, next we welcome, um, and with apologies for my pronunciation of his name, Stemislav Ostrowski. Um, he's a graduate of the Civil Engineering F Faculty at the Warsaw University of Technology in 2012. He specializes in research on asphalt mixture properties and in the engineering of asphalt layer properties to design and develop durable and safe asphalt pavements. Uh, his paper 0303 addresses compactability of asphalt mixtures with highly polymer modified bitumens. So please can we start up this presentation? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Malcolm Sims, for introducing me. Uh, the subject of the paper and uh, of my presentation is compactability of asphalt mixtures with uh, highly polymer modified bitumen. Uh, it was prepared uh, in uh, Holland Asphalt in the Research and Development Department. Uh, here is the short agenda of my presentation. First of all, uh, I will speak a bit about the goal of the project. Uh, then uh, HIMA characteristics uh, will be uh, described. Uh, then uh, I will uh, I will talk about uh, experimental materials and procedures. Uh, then I will show you the results uh, in three variants. And uh, at last, I will do some conclusions and uh, further recommendations. Uh, the goal of the project was uh, to determine the optimum compaction temperature uh, for mixtures containing uh, PMB HIMA bitumen. Uh, examination of impact of high production temperature of, of, on asphalt mixtures and consequently the overheating of uh, HIMA bitumen. Uh, and at last, uh, examination of impact of WMA additives on PMB HIMA bitumen. What is HIMA? Uh, HIMA is relatively new type of bitumen. It is modified by, by more than 7% uh, of SBS polymer. And such a high, uh, high quality, uh, quantity of SBS causes reversion, reversion of uh, volume proportions between bitumen and polymer. What is shown uh, on the picture on the right, uh, on the upper uh, picture, you can see uh, the volume proportion between uh, between uh, bitumen and polymer in HIMA uh, bitumen and on the lower uh, picture, you can see the proportions in classic uh, PMB uh, bitumen. Uh, due to its properties, uh, HIMA bitumens uh, are particularly suitable for heavy duties uh, works, especially uh, pavements uh, where uh, high stress and strain occurs, uh, where high resistance to low and high temperatures uh, is uh, demanded and uh, on by, uh, in by asphalt based courses uh, with very high fatigue durability. Uh, as uh, a reference mixture, SMA8 uh, was chosen. Uh, it was made of uh, gabbro aggregate and limestone filler. Uh, the, P uh, the bitumen was uh, PMB6510580. Uh, uh, HIMA in free uh, bitumen content. And the grading curve you can see on the right. Uh, our aim was to uh, was to uh, do some uh, tests that uh, will model uh, the real uh, compaction and paving uh, on the site in the laboratory. Uh, so for that purpose, uh, Dratory compactor was uh, chosen. Uh, the tests uh, were conducted according to EN standard. Uh, the parameters of Dratory compactor are given on the slide. Uh, and uh, our aim uh, was to determine two parameters. 
avoid content after first duration and uh, compatibility coefficient k. Uh, due to the fact uh, that comparison of uh, two parameters equation is uh, quite difficult, uh, the further analysis uh, used the indicator uh, V50, uh, what is uh, calculated void content after uh, 50th uh, duration. A second method used to uh, used to, to um, make some uh, conclusions about the uh, compactability was uh, construction energy index. Uh, it is uh, calculated by measuring the area uh, below the graph between uh, eight uh, compaction cycle, which represents the work performed by a typical paver during the placement, uh, but before the use of the roller. Uh, and uh, uh, the amount of 4.8%, uh, uh, which is 98% uh, uh, compaction uh, ratio. Uh, here, is, uh, here are the variants uh, of, the, uh, of the research. Uh, the purple rectangles uh, show um, determination of the optimum compaction temperature. Uh, the red ellipses uh, show the examination of high uh, temperature uh, of production and com compaction. Uh, and uh, green uh, triangles uh, show uh, the tests uh, of uh, WMA additives. Uh, here are the results uh, of the first part of our research. Uh, the result, uh, re results of optimum compaction temperature uh, as you can see, uh, there are mm, uh, these two parameters, uh, mm, K coefficient and uh, void content after first duration. And it's, uh, in fact, it is not so easy to tell uh, which uh, variant performed better than the other. So, uh, as I uh, said previously, uh, we decided to uh, change it for, for uh, parameter V50. Uh, and the second parameter is uh, C index. And uh, these both methods show that uh, uh, that the more uh, bitumen in the mix and the higher temperature of the mix uh, is, uh, the compaction, uh, the, the, the better the compaction is. Uh, the, optimum, the optimum compaction uh, temperature is about uh, 145, 165 Celsius degree. It is shown in both methods that uh, these uh, two temperatures are equivalent, um, uh, no matter uh, what is the uh, what is the amount of bitumen in the mix. Uh, second part of uh, our results: impact uh, of overheating. Uh, in comparison of uh, results uh, of compaction in recommended temperature, as you can see. Uh, in both methods, uh, C index and void content after 50th uh, duration, uh, below uh, 145 uh, Celsius degree, uh, there can be shown a deterioration of uh, compaction ratio uh, or compaction effectiveness uh, when um, mixture and bitumen is overheated. And uh, at last, the results of uh, WMA additives. Uh, two type uh, WMA additives were used, 2% of uh, fissure drops uh, wax and 0.4% of amine derivative. Uh, of course, uh, two methods. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the blue uh, graph is uh, for uh, mixture without uh, WMA additives. A uh, red one is uh, for fissure tropsh wax, and uh, green is for amine derivative. Uh, as you can see, uh, both uh, additives in 145 uh, Celsius degree uh, performed quite good. But uh, in 115 Celsius degree, uh, much better performed uh, fissure tropsh wax. Uh, and, and actually, uh, there can, can't be uh, seen any uh, improvement of compaction when using uh, amine derivative. Uh, what, are, what are the conclusions, uh, conclusions and the recommendations? Uh, the research confirmed the impact of temperature in, and the content uh, 
of PMB uh, HIMA bitumen on compactability. And uh, as I said, the best compactability is uh, in temperature range between 145 and 165 uh, Celsius degree. And the more bitumen in the mix, the better com uh, compactability is that it's obvious. Uh, the test performed on asphalt mixtures uh, subjected to um, elevated production and conduction, uh, conditioning temperature, uh, the, it was overheated, indicated a compactability deterioration uh, in temp temperatures below 145 uh, Celsius degree in comparison with asphalt mixtures produced and conditioned in optimum conditions. Uh, so our conclusion, conclusion uh, and recommendation is uh, and not to produce and, con uh, and condition uh, mixtures with uh, PMB HIMA mixtures above uh, 175 Celsius degree, uh, as it can uh, lead uh, to workability deterioration, uh, which can be uh, shown uh, on the side and, and make uh, works uh, difficult. Uh, what about WMA additives? Uh, as uh, I've said previously, uh, on when using these additives in compaction temperature about 145 degree, uh, Celsius degree, uh, both uh, additives uh, uh, works quite well, but uh, Fischer drops works uh, work uh, a bit better. But uh, in 115 Celsius degree, only fischer tropsch uh, shows good properties uh, and uh, very good results in improving uh, compaction. Uh, the tests were conducted within the research project application tests uh, of orbital HEMA in asphalt mixtures but performed between uh, 2016 and 2019. Uh, in the research and development department uh, of Orlen Asphalt. Uh, more uh, results of our research uh, could be found uh, in our publications uh, that can be downloaded for free from our web website. Uh, I will be, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer it. Thank you for your attention. Great. Um Thank you for your presentation on your uh, recent work. Um, so keep them to the clock. Um, just a reminder for the audience, don't forget to submit your inquiries on Slido. Uh, if we were in the real world, I'd assume you were all hungover, um, but we're virtual, so you can keep typing. Um, so the uh, final presentation in this session comes from uh, Frank Bielefeld. Frank was born and raised in the Netherlands and works for Structon Sidiello as a manager of the Central Laboratory, the R&D Department, and the Quality Control Department. He works on topics on intelligent compaction, information management, PMBs, asphalt mixtures, and construction. In 2015, he finished his PhD research at the University of Twente on the topic of professionalizing the asphalt construction process, aligning information technologies, operators' knowledge, and laboratory practices. Uh, a really good idea. Um, he's published about his research in various journals, national and international conferences and magazines. He's given various presentations about his research in national and international communities. During his research, he worked closely together with 11 Dutch contractors within the ASPARI network that gives him a unique background and set of skills in road construction. His paper 0340, Pavement Inform Information Modeling PIM, shows how Dutch contractors developed a life cycle pavement process and performance information system. And certainly this will be of interest to me and hopefully to everyone else in the audience. So please over to Frank's presentation. Hello everybody, my name is Frank Beileveld and today I will give a presentation about the pavement information modeling. Uh, Dutch contractors developed a life cycle pavement process and performance information system. Also, I want to acknowledge my co-authors and co-organizations. So we have developed PIM, the software tool, together with eight contractors and all these uh, people uh, co-wrote this, uh, this paper as well. 
Shortly the content of this presentation, I will start with the context, why we need PIM, what is PIM and what its scope is. I will give some examples of the web-based tool, how it professionalizes the industry, and I will uh, give a short outlook about further di digitization steps of the road construction industry. For some reasons why uh, we developed PIM, there are some trends in the road construction industry in which contractors are beside construction, also responsible for the design and maintenance of projects in which asset management and data and information, objective data and information are uh, increasingly important. Also the CE marking was introduced into the industry with functional specification and requirements. Um, also systems engineering and performance contracting are more, are more and more introduced in which evidence and traceability of information became increasingly important. Um, the development of BIM in the road construction industry and also the last decades, there was a plethora of sensors and technologies available for, for example, on-site construction data using GPS, laser and infrared leading to big data sets uh, in the construction industry. And there were some outdated systems, uh, uh, software systems available, but those were based on empirically knowledge and not on functional specification and based on old contracts. So together this led to the necessity to register, manage and exchange data from the road construction industry and to systematically store all the information in one system from the whole supply chain. And so we developed PIM with eight, with the eight biggest Dutch contractors in the Netherlands. Some goals of PIM. So uh, we wanted to have all the contracts, requirements, specification and characteristics of building materials and asphalt uh, road construction in one system. We wanted to have a central registration, control and management of materials, production information and onsite construction information. We wanted to have objective management information in terms of KPIs and not only for a specific project, but also to be able to analyze it over more projects. We wanted more evidence that we fulfill all the requirements towards our agencies. We wanted to have measured performance information and a proper archive for discussion about warranty and guarantee of roads projects. Um, we needed long-term monitoring of roads and we wanted to have more information about risk management and uh, input for product develop development, so which products are performing well and where, which products are performing poorly in, in situ. We wanted to have efficient information exchange and decrease the administrative pressure. Some information about the development process of PIM. So we started in April 2016 and we developed the first version until December 2019. And in 2020, we have implemented the software tool uh, at the contractors. We used a uh, Scrum Agile development strategy in which we had 35 sprints of three weeks. We had our own product owner and we had Key users from construction companies who were writing the user stories for the IT software company. Those key users and testers were three days a week physically at present at the software company in order to close the gap between the construction company and the IT software company. And in total, it costed about 55,000 hours, about 4 million euros. Um, half of it was about input from the eight contractors, about 25,000 hours and uh, about three and a half million from the IT company. Here's an example of the web-based tool. Um, and we also developed an app for Apple and Android uh, to use it uh, offline. So there's no internet connection needed. For which materials can PIM be used for? For all the building materials for road construction. Uh, so uh, for an asphalt construction, aggregate sand, filler, bitumen, additives, rejuvenators, and all the characteristics, characteristics of these building materials can be put into PIM. All the subsurface materials and foundation materials, both bound and unbound materials, for example, a cement treated base as well. And of course, all the asphalt mixture characteristics and performance information. Which processes can PIM be used for? So for all the material testing, so during the CE marking of the potential characteristics, the production control at the asphalt plant and in situ control the cores from the construction site. Also during production, transportation and on-site construction, all the information that is gathered uh, can be put into PIM. 
Also, we wanted to be BIM ready. So all the information in BIM uh, can be uh, attributed to a physical decomposition layer. On the right side, you can see the whole road object. And on the left side, you can see the each individual construction unit and each unit consists of a specific mixture and building material. And here's an example how the information is attributed to each construction unit. Also, we wanted to be ready for spatial decomposition, so all the information in PIM can be GPS-based uh, and visualized uh, in PIM. Here's an example of the production scheduling at the asphalt plant. So all the orders of asphalt production can be put into PIM, and you can see that it is like an Outlook uh, view. Here's an example of the factory production control, which shows the variability in the production quality. Also, we wanted to have a dashboard, including uh, KPIs, uh, key performance indicators about the used uh, building materials, about prices, about the amount of recycled asphalt, incoming and outgoing material streams, about uh, the, about the non-conformities conformities during production or the non-conformity and deviations per construction unit of the on-site construction process, for example, the density, the void content, bitumen content, etc. And uh, you can analyze all the results over several projects. Of course, PIM is not the only software tool in, in, in the IT architecture of a company. So it also had to be possible to exchange information from one software tool to, to, to another. So we have developed some APIs, uh, application programming interfaces to exchange information. For example, to exchange information with an ERP package regarding financial information or uh, relation of relation information of clients. And also we can exchange information with a GIX GIS package, for example, with ArcGIS. Here's an example how the future could look like. So an automatic data collection during the onsite construction process outside. Some results of PIM. So we fulfill all the requirements uh, and we show evidence of it. We have some direct savings, so we need less time to make delivery files, etc. And of course, we have some indirect savings uh, so we have insight into production quality and on-site construction quality to make better project and product choices. In conclusion, PIM leads to a professionalization of the industry regarding information management. It leads to a more efficient process and information exchange with agencies, and it's the first stepping stone of a BIM standard for roads. Some fu future steps that we plan to take are to further implement PIM and to gather more data and to develop a data lake to combine all the PIM information with traffic intensities and maintenance. So finally, you can see PIM as the birth certificate of a road, and each road has a BIM, PIM birth certificate, which materials are used, how it was produced, how it was constructed. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, you can contact me by this email address or phone number. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Frank. Uh, definitely very interesting from my perspective of someone representing asphalt producers and contractors. Um, so to finish our session, uh, welcome back our last three presenters to answer your slide questions. Um, I think, yeah, they're all on screen. If you just open your microphones quickly and say hello. 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 Yep, you're all still connected. Great stuff. Um, so moving on quickly, um, again, I'll try and take these in, in order to let some more questions come in. Um, for uh, Richard, uh, have you worked with any of the equipment manufacturers? So those that manufacture paving and milling equipment, so that the, the data you're generating is is live within the, within the project. It's not something you generate and then come back and pick up later. Yeah, super good question. Um... We've actually not done that uh, to date. Um, this is a kind of a bit of a new application of this technology, but um, we definitely would be interested in that. I think that um, integrating the technology into the process so that you can use it 
to uh, effectively monitor Azure uh, performing your project, I think is a great idea. Yeah, well, I mean, when I saw the presentation, I thought, and similar to the Lime application, do we need another process in the middle to slow things down and add cost? Mm -hmm. uh, getting all those things combined is obviously an ideal. Uh, I suspect the technology is a bit expensive yet to be bumping on the paving machine. It's it's a bit expensive for that probably, but uh, yeah, but but uh, there should be some thought given as to how to integrate it uh, effectively. I think, yeah. Great. Um, there was a question which had your name on, Richard, but I don't think is for you. Um, querying optimal compaction temperatures with PMB and virgin bitumen. So I suspect that's one for Eric <laughs> Laff, who's who's been getting the majority of the questions. Um, so um, on that, we had, why do you think that the wax outperformed the warm mix at 115? And are aiming derivatives stable in storage? Do they influence the elasticity of HIMA? Uh, so thank you for the question. It's, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we have, done a lot of uh, tests of, of, of compactability of mixtures of diff different types of mixtures uh, of uh, asphalt concretes and uh, this SMA uh, mixture and uh, it's, it is actually uh, quite difficult to say why uh, in uh, one mixture uh, uh, wax is uh, performed better than, than the uh, I mean derivative uh, than in the others uh, so uh, we we are we are checking this actually and uh, uh, investigating that uh, it, it is uh, due to the uh, amount of the bitumen uh, in the mixture and the type of the of the mix because uh, so mastic uh, asphalt is, uh, have, have different mass matrix uh, stone matrix than uh, asphalt concrete. Uh, so uh, this is uh, maybe not the, the full the answer, but uh, yes, we, we are just still looking for for the, the for this answer. And uh, what about the what about the, the stability uh, of storage? Uh, so um, actually, we uh, don't uh, we didn't see the the deterioration of uh, the storage uh, time. When using uh, this, I mean, uh, derivative. Uh, but of course, uh, what is what uh, what it was uh, shown? Uh, Hima is quite specific uh, bitumen that uh, shouldn't be overheated. So, of course, uh, if the temperature at the production plant uh, in the storage tanks uh, is properly uh, actually uh, about 160, 170. Uh, the receipt, it's okay, but uh, if it's higher, uh, of course, uh, we didn't check it because uh, because uh, of the deterioration of the bitumen itself uh, without any uh, additives. Yeah, and just a very quick one, and I've got a similar thought. What do you view as the difference between workability and compactability? Are they different? For, for me, my answer would be workability is how it goes through a plant and equipment. And compactability is once it's at the back of the paver, how easy is it to get to the required voids? That's my view. What's your yeah, opinion? It's, it's also a very good question. Uh, and actually, uh, we have done some uh, tests uh, according to that. And of course, uh, as you said, uh, the compactability is something about uh, something to do with uh, compaction at the site, and uh, workability is uh, at the mixing plant. And uh, to be honest, uh, we are going to publish a paper uh, about the mastic asphalt uh, and uh, workability of this uh, this type of um, this type of mi mixture. And uh, probably in a few months, it will appear in, in, in one of the, uh, uh, this, this, this publication will appear. So uh, stay tuned and uh, you can uh, see the, the results because of course uh, we checked the workability in the mixing drum with uh, 
uh, with the force uh, measurement uh, and the compactability as as you can see in this paper is uh, measured by the Jeter compactor or Marshall uh, compactor as well. Great, thanks. And just make sure you, you had the biggest photo actually, Frank, so you're not uh, you're not being left out here. Um, from actually calling him out in the UK, Giacomo. Uh, from an agency perspective, so as the, the road owner or operator, do you see any challenge in managing as well as ensuring the accuracy and validating of this big amount of data? And my follow-up to that would be, um, how do we ensure that data actually represents information? Um, Richard, you might have views on that. Uh, over to you, Frank. Um, yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, well, reliability and accuracy of the data is, of course, always a problem. Um, a PIM won't change that, of course. Um, but I mean, we've developed PIM from a more from a uh, contractor perspective in order to get reliable data about the performance of, of like uh, the asphalt information and production quality and on site construction quality in order to improve our products and to get a better idea of uh, risk assessment. But of course, um, yeah, accuracy and reliability is a problem or can be a problem. On the other hand, PIM also helps you to work according to the guidelines, to the European norms, etc. So in some kind of way, it helps you to work according to the regulations. Um, and the next question about data and information, it's, it's always a uh, difficulty. Um, I mean, data is just numbers and the information is to, uh, yeah, to do something valuable with it. And to, ex yeah, I mean, uh, database system. So it is information and we need to do, to, to, to do something valuable with it. Correct. Absolutely right. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, right, so finally, we're, we're right up against the line here to close. Firstly, thanks to all the presenters and their co-researchers for the high-quality papers, uh, which, of course, are available to download from the event website. The papers go through a rigorous peer review and feedback process in the months ahead of this event to ensure they're high-quality that you, the audience, expect. Secondly, thanks to everyone who submitted the stimulated and challenging questions and comments. Uh, you may wish to con continue these discussions in the dedicated session 6B chat room in the networking lines. And finally, if I were to find a common theme of this session and others, it would probably be that knowledge is power. The more we know about what we have in terms of our components, the conditions, everything we know in the road, then the better able we are to be able to design the right materials, treatments, interventions, and ideally before road conditions become an issue. So thanks again, everyone, to their, uh, for their participation. And please enjoy the remainder of the Congress. Uh, and another virtual round of applause. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>